I'm on my way to meet garden designer Peter Nixon, who's known for his plant-led garden style. He's been bringing his special touch to Sydney Gardens for over 40 years. And I'm going to visit one of his cool projects where he's cleverly devised four green walls using subtropical plants. Can't wait. This garden is located on a steeply sloped block in Sydney's north, a stone's throw from the CBD. Tony, Hi, Peter. Fancy seeing you here. <laughs> Over the last two decades, Peter has transformed his client's Federation home, which is overlooked by towering offices, into a lush private oasis. Peter, I'm loving what I'm seeing so far. What was the client's vision for this space? Well, in the beginning, it was really informed by the constraints of the site. So we knew that there was a huge towering office block on the other side of the lane. And that was unfortunate because there were a lot of passive sight lines that read into the back, back garden. To maintain privacy, the clients wanted vertical gardens that had height, with plants that had a lot of contrast in colour and texture. They also wanted year-round interest. We're in cool subtropic Sydney, meaning that there's no frost, to speak of, and the minimum winter overnight would probably not drop below five or six. So the minute you step into that, there's a huge bandwidth of planting that you can grow. I could only show you that just the tip of the iceberg, and availability always comes into play, but you know, I wouldn't let a small thing like that get in my way, Tammy. <laughs> it was an open sky quality that the block had already, and I didn't want to take that away. As you enter the back of the house, you're presented with a north-easterly or sheltered section of the double-sided green wall. On this green wall here, I've used Tradescantia pallida for the bright violet leaf. And along the top line, we've used more sun-tolerant bromeliads like Bilberga amoena that has little windows in that's like a crushed strawberry colour. And for the very top, there's Acmea blanchettiana and Combata with a thick, hard, leathery leaf that's very resistant. Sitting up there on the top of four and a half metres of green wall, you're not going to be spared, are you? <laughs> and although there's water that's running through the green wall, you still need to be able to keep your bromeliads upright so that they can catch the rain inside the cup. And I can see that you've actually got a couple of ferns throughout here. So even though this is a north-east aspect, these ferns are dealing with that heat. You can see how they're aggregating to the first metre or so of the vertical height. Yep. That's because there's more water that tends to be near the bottom of the panel. Mm -hmm. And ferns are a bit moisture dependent. They don't have a very primitive root system. It's not terribly efficient. But they think that they're growing on a rock face with water running through it. So really about recreating its natural environment. That's right. So always trying to replicate what would be the growing condition in habitat so that then the plant can do it for you. Speaking to textural contrast, you might choose some Ripsala species like this one here. That's going to contrast with Collaria eriantha. That way then, even before the flowers come, you've got interest over the whole year mm -hmm. rather than having to rely just on the flowers that come and go. And so do you also have to consider, I guess, the, the feeding needs of these plants when putting them all together? Good question. So there is an irrigation system that runs uh, through the central manifold of each panel and they're all joined together. And there's an injector fertiliser that goes into the water that feeds the wall. Now that we've discovered what plants are on this side of the double green wall, let's take a look at the flip side. So we've entered the other side now. What's different about this side? So vastly different because now we're held up to the hot northwest. So that still holds true for the very top of the green wall. Mm -hmm. And all of those plants up there have to tolerate high exposure in very roasting radiation. As you get further and further south on the green wall, what's happened is over the last four or five years, the camellias have expanded on both sides and they've made a little microclimate between that holds the midpoint of the green wall in. And you might notice that, that Streptocarpus coalescens, the little nodding violet, yeah. that's drifted down the green wall into more shelter. You've got the Streptocarpus weaving in with the... Epiphyllum chrysocardium. Yep. So that's the big golden heart jungle cactus that flowers at night. Mm -hmm. But it's also drifting a little bit further down the green wall. Seeking more shade. To get away from the really harsh scorch that would be at the top of the wall. 
from the double-sided green wall, it's over to a wall of a very different kind, a Brazilian-inspired checkerboard wall. Peter, I love this one. Like, the colour, it just speaks to me. <laughs> it's a statement maker, isn't it? Its prime function is, once you've made it out of the house, that you look at this on a slightly higher level. So it works off negative space being painted out and then planted space which comes forward. So it's working actually on textual contrast. That's why we call it a matrix checkerboard. Each one is a mini green wall and the irrigation is linked at the corner points. You might notice that quite a few of the plantings are peperomia, which is an indoor tamiya. Well, yeah, I've mostly seen them indoor. I haven't seen them planted out like this. It's That's just... right. The reason why it, they're outside, that they're growing out here at all, this whole aspect is dead south. In the summer, when the shade shrinks right back to the wall, all of this is cast into the heat in the hot afternoon sun. So you've got maiden hair fern. Pepperoni is thriving That's in right. the heat. Yeah. Because, like, tell me your secret. Well, <laughs> when you grow them epiphytically like this, you're tricking the plant into thinking it's growing on a rock face with water dripping through. And the minute you do that, it makes the plant very resilient to heat. The only thing with it is you need to cut to shape. And if you don't, then it's all going to merge together and you'll lose the effect. Yeah. So in the growing period, probably once every five to seven weeks, you need to get the head shears out. It's not a dainty job, you just cut it any old way. <laughs> Brutal. Short back and sides, yep. cut the front off, and then you'll have this springy cut surface which will then flush with new growth. And we've got another green wall. One more green wall to show you. All right, let's have a look. So, Peter, we've barely walked 20 steps from the last green wall, but this one is so different. Really, we've just crossed one side of the back garden to the other. Oh, so viva la difference. Over there is harsh west held up to the hot sun in the summer. And here is tall south, meaning that in the winter, no sun at all. So that means that you have to change the plant selection to suit for the growing condition. When the summer comes, and a lot of these things will have intense but brief sun. We also wanted to try and reduce the maintenance. People might think, oh, well, I'll just put some pots there. But it puts all the onus on them to keep the water up, to keep the nutrition up. It's actually quite hard work. What you could do instead is have a series of flatback half baskets and you could populate them with epiphytes that think they're growing on a tree. So they're in flatback baskets, so they obviously sit flush against the wall. Just That's right. Out at you. So in the beginning, you can see all the individual planting, but if you part the foliage, you'll see that there's baskets there that are just growing one under the other, so they drip into each other. Peter, we've seen four very different wars, but it's quite clear that plant selection is crucial. It's really, really crucial. Unless you make the selection close enough to the growing condition, then the poor plant will fail. And no plant wants to fail, Tammy. <laughs> That's right. No one wants to die. I'm just getting some shots of this checkerboard wall for some home inspo. I'm loving the Brazilian vibe. If you've got some tight spaces or want some privacy, then consider a green wall like these because you too can create your own living tapestry full of lush tropical plants.